Greetings. Um, I'm Marilyn Trent, and I'm the founder of the Rochester Pollinators, which was a committee um, created to save the monarch butterfly and encourage people to do that by restoring the natural habitat by planting Michigan native plants in their local landscapes. Um, that grew to be a larger initiative to also save the pollinator insects as well. Because if you could save the monarch butterfly, you can save the rest of the um, pollinator insects too. Um, let's see, I am here to do two things, tell you why and how to plant a butterfly and pollinator garden. I'm gonna start out with a little background and some history about uh, the monarch and the reasons for the decline and the need to pet plant Michigan native plants, and then we'll dive right into um, how to plant a butterfly and a pollinator garden and how easy that is and some of the plants and um, all this and to keep your garden blooming from June or May until May, June until uh, the end of October. So let's start. Saving our butterflies and pollinators by restoring our natural habitats. Um, Jane Giblin and I, uh, Jane uh, is a master gardener and she was in advisory and uh, on helping me put this presentation together. We talked a little bit about the mission, um, but I will, this is the full mission of the Rochester Pollinators and we are here to provide education and resources to preserve and save the monarch butterfly and the pollinator population by reintroducing native plants into local landscapes, which is your home, your gardens, your businesses, municipal landscapes, and others, so we can help our local pollinators flourish. So what you're gonna to learn today is a little bit about how my journey began. Um, if you want to skip to that, uh, to how to plant the garden, you can more than welcome to do that. Um, it is uh, just to move the slider uh, to the introduction of how to plant a, the pollinator garden. But we'll talk about the need, what's the problem, why native plants, why the monarch butterfly, why we need the pollinators, talk a little bit about the Mayor's Monarch Pledge um, that is a national initiative to um, uh, save uh, the pollinators uh, across the uh, United States. We'll talk about a starter garden, uh, pollinator plants blooming through three seasons, and where to purchase them. Um, my journey began uh, when I found out about a year ago in January, the um, crucial um, crossroads of the decline of the monarch butterfly, um, because over the past 20 years, um, they've been declining to the amount of 75 to 90 percent, and that is um, getting close to extinction. Um, so here is the video that I think will help explain. La mariposa ya llegó, la mariposa está aquí, oh, es para ti, yo sé que quieres bailar, me jala la mano, me dice el canto, me dice la me dice la rica, uh, la mariposa llegó, uh, la mariposa está aquí. A decade ago, when my family rode horses up the mountain in Michoacan, Mexico, to see the winter home of the monarch butterflies, we were greeted by an incredible sight. Tens of millions of monarchs, sheltered from the winter cold, and waiting to start their incredible migration. As the weather turned to spring, these monarchs would all fly north, but none of them would ever return. Instead, they'd lay eggs, and successive generations of monarchs would continue with full migration. The following fall, millions more monarchs, descendants of the butterflies all around us, would miraculously find their way back to this same spot, a cycle that has continued for untold centuries. 
Caught up in the wonder, you could never have imagined that just a decade later, North America's monarch population would have decreased by over 90%. St. Meadow, 11 years later, where did all the monarchs go? Now citizens and scientists alike are asking the same question, what can be done to save the monarchs? The decline in monarch populations was first attributed to illegal logging in the reserves. It's a huge problem, but the local communities have partnered with environmental nonprofits from Mexico, from the US, from Canada. Reforestation efforts are bringing the forest back. More trees means more cover for the monarchs. Comunidades que son los dueños de los bosques han convertido ellos en los protectores directamente de sus bosques, porque se han dado cuenta que no solo para la conservación de la monarca sirven estos bosques, sino para su mantenimiento propio. Kuta, hi, we're at Crescencio Morales School with these great kids and their big tree nursery here, and all the trees they're going to be planting out into the forest. And these kids are holding OML firs, the trees the monarchs roost on in the winter. <laughs> I'm with Celia, and this is her uh, energy efficient stove uh, built with uh, our friends at Alternare, who do workshops on building these stoves in all the communities near the forest. And uh, that reduces harvesting of wood in the forest. Te gusta? Sí, sí, me gusta. <laughs> The smaller numbers of monarchs in this area, they're more concentrated on fewer number of trees, so we have to go further up the mountain. It's a cool, cloudy day. Butterflies are huddled together on the trees, keeping each other warm. Conserving energy like this is how they're able to live through the whole winter and fly back the United States, this is a super generation of the monarchs. They live much longer than the other generations. We're here in Cerro Pelon. Uh, and we're, we're by 2,300 meters over sea level. And as they actually saw an explosion there. It's beautiful, look at that. There's always some butterfly mortality. This guy might make it, or maybe not. But if a tag butterfly dies, the tag might fall to the forest floor. We'll take that back to Monarch Watch. The log number in there can be traced back and uh, can find out where the butterfly was tagged somewhere north of the flyway. This is the male, you can tell by the pheromone dot. This is the female, and the mating can last six hours. After they mate, the female will fly north and find milkweed and lay eggs, 400 of them. So if a lot of monarchs move out of the reserves, there they go. If a lot of monarchs move out of the reserves, they can uh, expand their numbers greatly if they have milkweed. When these monarchs fly north on their migration, they only have a few weeks of energy left to find milkweed and lay eggs for the next generation. In northern Mexico and southern Texas, drought, heavy grazing, and a changing climate have significantly reduced milkweeds and pollinator plants. As they come out of this mountain, some monarchs rely on having milkweed across Tamaulipas, Coahuila, South Texas in February and March. So those monarchs that overwinter are finding almost no host plants, and now that first wave may pretty much perish before they get out of that South Texas, Northern Mexico. So what you're going to lose is the phenomenon of the migratory population. This is Flepus viridis. This is a green milkweed and it has a rounded leaf. It grows rather prostrate. It's about as upright as it gets and then it just kind of sprawls out in the growing season. The hopes are when the monarchs are moving back from Mexico to central Texas in the spring, that they would be able to lay their eggs on the backs of the leaves of these 
when the egg hatches out into a caterpillar, the caterpillar has to eat only these leaves of milkweed. Three weeks goes by and the caterpillar morphs into another butterfly and it takes off and heads northbound to the corn belt. The further north they go, the more challenges the monarchs meet in finding milkweed to nurture the next generation. Industrial agriculture practices, the U.S. ethanol mandate, genetically modified crops, paired with intensive use of herbicides and pesticides, have combined to wipe out much of the milkweeds the monarchs depend upon. To save the monarch migration, we're going to need superhighways of milkweed and other native plants reaching far north across the United States and into Canada. That means planting milkweed in large patches everywhere, of public and private land, parks, golf courses, on utility easements and at schools. Monarchs lay eggs all along their migration. So we're going to plant milkweeds and pollinator plants for butterfly food. When the milkweed leaves get eaten, look for monarch caterpillars. Monarchs are just one little indicator of a much larger problem. We're seeing the demise of the insect levels of our food web that is crashing. There's 78 species of native bees in Texas. And so if you're doing something good for the monarch, it's gonna also be something good for the other native species. The future generations are going to know this beauty. It's up to each of us to do our part. Okay, so basically what they talked about, and I'll go into this a little bit more, is the migratory path from central Mexico where the butterfly, super butterfly overwinters um, because it's the fourth generation that is created in, um, in the north and Michigan is uh, one of the um, places that it is um, created. Um, and that's why it's so important that we in Michigan plant milkweed and also plant other pollinator plants because the milkweed, as they said in this video, is the host plant and it's the only plant and we have several types of milkweed that the a monarch butterfly can, um, can lay its eggs and produce the, the caterpillars because it's the only food that the caterpillars will eat. Um, okay, so the life cycle of the monarch butterfly uh, was also discussed a bit. The female lays three, up to three to four hundred eggs at a time, and within a, in there, these little small white eggs. You can see number one, and then the caterpillar is born, and um, then it becomes a J. It gets into a J shape when it, it gets to correct uh, to correct size. It grows to the size that um, um, it grows to before becomes a chrysalis. And then uh, the third um, part of the cycle is the chrysalis cycle. And um, it's quite fascinating because the um, chrysalis is not, doesn't, uh, is actually the caterpillar sheds its skin and inside it is that chrysalis. The chrysalis is beautiful. It's a cerulean green and um, has a little gold band on it that looks like real gold. And um, within a few weeks um, before the butterfly has been fully created, they call it eclosing. It is born or eclosed. And you can see that the, um, before that happens, the uh, chrysalis becomes translucent and the butterfly is eclosed. And then it flies um, away to uh, find the pollinator plants. And the fourth generation here, or the third sometimes, will have to creek, uh, fly the 2,500 miles to um, central Mexico to overwinter. So they will live up to five, six, seven months. That generation will. So when I started my journey, I, was, I saw the video and I saw that up to 90% of the monarch butterfly um, population had declined. 
and it was quite disturbing to me. And um, after I found out about the monarch decline, I was reading and learned that 40% of our pollinator insects are also in decline. And we need them because a third of our food supply is dependent upon pollination. Um, nearly 90% of all of our flowering plants, including the fruits and vegetable crops, do benefit from pollinators. And many of our favorite foods uh, would either totally disappear or it'd be extremely rare and expensive. And I listed a few here, avocados, cherries, tequila, coffee, wine, apples for apple pie, lemons for lemonade, raspberries, tomatoes, and almonds, to name a few. But basically what I say, what I say is our pollinators feed us. Six of our popular native pollinators are here, um, represented here. The uh, hummingbird is a pollinator, and of course we have the monarch butterfly. There's um, on the left, we have the uh, tiger, um, the, oh gosh, the, um, mm, the tiger, so, uh, tiger swallowtail, sorry. The ladybug and um, a bee, and uh, native bees, and then the Baltimore checkerboard. This is just to name a few. There's flying ants, and um, dragonflies are also pollinators, and including bats. And they touched up on it in the um, video, but why is, it, why is this happening? Well, they've lo we've lost a lot of habitat. Over 40 million acres have been altered um, with lawns and agriculture. There's been pesticides that have been introduced and herbicides that kill, these, to kill the butterflies and the insects. And there have been new diseases along with the altered con uh, landscapes what I just mentioned and some climate change challenges. <clears throat> But people are trying to do their part and it's starting to make a difference. Um, besides awareness, uh, one, of the one of the ways that they've done this um, is through outreach uh, at a national level. The Nor National Wildlife Federation um, created the Mayor's Monarch Pledge a few years ago and hundreds of mayors have signed up for it and it helps address and activate uh, 24 actions. Um, uh, in this pledge. And the Rochester pollinators have helped um, activate nine of the 24 actions so far. I always let people know that the good news is it's an ecologically solvable problem. You can grow native plants in your own backyard and it's so easy. Look, I am not a very good gardener. I am not a master gardener, but I have created a lovely garden uh, based on the starter garden um, uh, landscape design that uh, we have worked with with the master gardeners to come up with uh, so anyone can do it. So native plants, they add beauty and habitat and food and cover. Um, they feed our local insects and pollinators. Um, invasive species do not. They feed our birds and we need our birds. And in the summer and the winter, the seeds will feed in the summer. They feed our birds in the summer, but in the winter, the seeds will feed them. And that's, a, that's if you don't cut them down. They keep our ecosystem healthy by filtering water through their deep root systems and they feed us, as I mentioned before. <laughs> um, the benefits are they're very low maintenance. They, it takes less mowing, which reduces air pollution. They need less water to do to their deep roots. And I'll show you a little bit, I'll show you a slide on that. Um, they save money because they're perennial, so they grow back each year and they need no herbicides and pesticides. Like I mentioned, their deep roots are part of how amazing they are, and it, those roots help filter out pollutants and they decrease uh, soil compaction. compaction. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I mentioned, the deep root system was amazing when I saw, when I saw this slide um, for the first time. It was a few years ago. Um, I couldn't believe the difference in what a non-native plant root system looks like as a compared to the native plant. You can see on the far left, there's a, there's a plant called Spirea. I'm not as familiar with that, but the roots only go to like two and a half feet. The daylilies, I know that which we've seen on the highways and everywhere that you 
see plants in a lot of the commercial landscaping and other places, they go, they don't even get down to two feet. Um, your perennial fountain uh, grass is a little bit longer, gets three and a half feet. And then we have our turf and that doesn't even make it, I don't know, two or three inches. Um, but on the native plant side, buffalo grass gets down past almost 10 feet. Your prairie dot, drop seed gets to about 10 feet as well. Black-eyed Susans, you may be familiar with them, that's seven to eight feet. And then we've got the common nine bark, which is over 15 feet. So this is good for stormwater um, filtering and, fil and, um, retain and helping water retention so that you don't have that flooding. Um, that we see in the streets and in our basements and uh, along our sidewalks. So if you plant native plants and milkweed, the pollinators and butterflies do come. And the native plants are not weeds, uh, they are beautiful. And here are a few, um, in the upper left is the um, the orange, uh, which is an orange, lovely orange plant, it's the butterfly milkweed. Um, below it is the uh, cardinal flower, which is a beautiful red. And on the right is a cone flower. And I bet you have seen these. Uh, the, I bet you've seen the cone flower a lot. It's a beautiful tall plant and its bloom uh, stays blooming for quite a while. On the left, is a um, pollinator garden that was planted by one of our local businesses. And uh, this was the first year. And um, it has, uh, you can see there's uh, some Coreopsis, there's a Cardinal flower, there's Black Eyed Susans, and um, some other plants in there. It looks like a cone flower as well. Um, and then on the right is another one that was planted um, as well. And um, it's a beautiful little garden. And this was the first year. The, um, uh, this is a monarch butterfly and it was taken in my garden and it, um, it came with the game. Uh, I had lots of um, uh, caterpillars that um, were uh, created in, on my milkweed plant um, and I raised a lot of monarchs um, inside my home once they became caterpillars to try to save them. And um, on the right, um, there, this is uh, the main street where they integrated some um, uh, native plants in the gardens in downtown Rochester. So you don't have to, I'm not saying replace everything uh, in your garden, but just if you could start integrating some native plants, it will, um, it will help feed the pollinators. And there were quite a few butterflies that were cut, came in or sighted in the downtown Rochester and a hummingbird on a busy Main Street. Uh, we also planted a butterfly demonstration garden or at the Rochester Municipal Park in the summer of 2019 and it was quite well received and it was um, it's a beautiful garden and uh, they're going to expand it this year. Uh, they had quite a lot of positive feedback and people loved it. So the types of gardens and habitats that you that uh, you can have is a rain garden, which can be sun or shade, but usually sun. The forest woodland, which is shade to part to shade. A prairie, which is full sun, or and can you can use sun or shade. Sun or shade may be intermittent with the prairie. Um, for more information, um, there is the MSU website. Uh, and you can Google or search for smart gardening. There's Michigan Audubon. PrairieNursery.com has a lot of great information uh, there as well. You, um, they sell plants, but they also have a, they're a great resource for the types of plants you can plant and um, where, they, where they thrive the best. Um, uh, so you can just use that as a resource. There's Wild Ones of Michigan and Wildflower Association of Michigan. Landscapes considerations. When you're thinking of planting your pollinator garden, think, take a look at the plant height, soil, and sun. They will grow back each year, so you um, know that you can take that in consideration as well. Um, you can also transplant them when they do come back if they're not fitting in that um, area as well as you'd like. Um, you can have a foundation or focal point that could be a tree, a shrub, a rock, 
sculpture or bench, and then you have to think about maintenance, and they are low maintenance. The types of soil. Um, that is, uh, there's clay soils, which absorb water slowly and retain water, and the plants that you plant there need strong roots. There's sandy soils, which are coarse, and they never have standing water, and they drain rapidly. And then you have your moist soils, which are typically wet in spring, and they may experience standing water after rain, and the surface may dry, and, but the subsoil usually stays moist. So an easy point of entry, which um, uh, is these plants are quite tolerant of, um, you know, different types of soils um, and also um, sun to part shade. So we put this as an easy, we created this as an easy point of entry as a pollinator garden starter plan. And we also suggest planting two types of milkweed, the butterfly milkweed and the rose milkweed. And the butterfly milkweed is, is, a, is a, a shorter plant and it grows to be about one to three feet tall. But then you've got the nice tall rose milkweed, which is beautiful little pink buds that grow three to four feet tall. Um, you're, so when we're talking about the heights, that's what you can think about is, is when you're um, planning your garden. We put this one together, we created this one based on the heights and how many um, should be, you know, clusters together and, and we created it so you get different colors uh, during the season, blooming um, and at all, all three seasons. Um, and and it's worked out really well. Uh, we haven't had any complaints yet, and we've handed out over uh, a thousand of these, or a thousand to fifteen hundred of these plants in our brochure. Um, this also has the New England aster, the Mar Marsh Blazing Star, the Wild Columbine, the Beard Tongue, um, the Purple Coneflower, and the Black Eyed Susans. We do have a few suggestions on where to purchase these plants. Um, there's Ray Wiegand's in Macomb. There's Fogler's in Rochester, Wild Type Nursery. Um, they uh, are all the way in Ma Mason, and they do have some uh, days that they will um, sell to, the, to, the, to retailers. They're mostly uh, wholesalers, but I add them in there. Um, because uh, they are a great resource for the real uh, authentic native plant. You can always know that you can get that there. Um, I mean, Folgers and Wiggins does also. Um, and then Michigan Wildflower Farm has uh, seeds. Um, so we have a list of the Michigan native plants that um, beyond our starter garden list. And um, this is uh, for those who want to um, go past the two plants that we recommend for a starter garden. And then on the right, we talk about the preferred um, we uh, pollinator annuals that do have uh, nectar uh, for the um, for the pollinators and the butterflies. They but they are annuals, and we didn't want to just um, present the uh, Michigan native plants. Um, we don't want to be so strict. We want to make sure that people love the beauty of their gardens and some people want uh, the annual plants. So we, we, we chose a list that we felt was a, a, good, a good choice, a good choice of color, and it also um, has uh, nectar. Um, this is available uh, in a garden um, packet on the Rochester mi.org slash pollinators website. Uh, we have a lot of downloads and this one's called the garden packet and it has garden plans. It has places to buy a uh, extensive or more comprehensive list of where to buy Michigan native plants and it also um, has a garden plans for other than the starter garden. So here I'm going to start into dive right into uh, early spring and the uh, three seasons of plants that can keep your garden blooming um, until uh, from May, uh, I mean April, until uh, October. Woodland phlox, they are um, full, it's a plant that is a, a 
it's a low growing plant. You can see these in the woods and it does, uh, it is one of the few full shade um, native plants that are available. And um, we uh, wanted to at least get a, um, we wanted to get a plant in the, in our, in our um, presentation that would take and uh, tolerate full shade. Um, Virginia bluebells, that's part shade. It can tolerate part shade. It uh, grows one to two feet tall. You can see it has, it prefers a rich, moist and organic uh, soil. Um, you can find them in moist, rich woods and river floodplains. So you can see what part of the yard, if you have that uh, type of soil and um, uh, area in your yard, this would be a good plant to choose. Um, it attracts hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, it must be overplanted. It clumps, um, maybe sprinkle in borders or, or along rock gardens, and it seeds around easily in new beds. We've got uh, the wild columbine. I've grown this one, and it's a lovely plant. Uh, it's full to part shade. It is grows one to three feet tall and has a beautiful red pink um, bloom. It prefers rich and dark medium and well drained soil. Um, it freely self seeds. Um, and it, um, it, like I said, it's just a beautiful little plant and um, I'd suggest, and it is in our um, starter garden plan. The wild geranium, uh, these are a low growing plant. Uh, it's also uh, can tolerate part shade, but, uh, and it's um, flexible. It will take full sun as well. And you can see it's a, uh, Soil is medium and well drained. Um, it does like a little bit of moisture, and um, but will naturalize in uh, optimum growing position conditions. Golden Alexander, I love this one. It is um, full sun to part shade. It uh, height it grows up to three feet. Um, it blooms in um, uh, has a long blooming season. It attracts the butterflies and native bees. They just love the golden Alexander. The foxglove um, or beard tongue. This is a, a tall growing plant, two to three feet. Um, it will like, it takes average to wet soil. It takes glot and it also grows in clay and dry soil. Um, and it attracts the butterflies and birds and it, uh, it's uh, deer resistant. Culver's root, full sun, but it will take some light shade. And if you don't have full sun, I would focus on the uh, tolerant ones of partial shade because um, the ones that love full sun, they really love full sun. And they're a little bit harder to grow if there's not um, more than six or eight hours or sun a day. This one is, a, you can see it's a tall, uh, plant and it's good vertical height for borders. So now let's get into summer, late June, July, and early August. And here's another favorite, uh, purple coneflower. It is a very easy plant to grow, and it, but it, it loves full sun, but it tolerates partial shade. It can tolerate different types of soil. It does like to be dry. Uh, to average, it grows to four feet tall. I, I once you have um, once you've identified these, you can you'll start seeing them everywhere, and they're in a lot of rain, rain gardens. Um, they're just a very popular plant, and the butterflies and the birds and the bees love them. Uh, they're a long blooming flower, and they are in our starter garden um, plan. The meadow rue is partial shade. Uh, and it grows three to five feet, and it um, takes dry to average soil. It also attracts the butterfly, birds, and bees. And like we said, uh, these are Michigan native plants, so they will um, attract um, a pollinators, but some of them attract more than others, and uh, some of them attract more birds than, um, than others. And everybody's always wanting to know about um, deer resistant and this is one of those. The yellow cum flower. Now this one is, um, I don't see this as often, but I do, it's a beautiful plant. I love the yellow, uh, the yellow color is a nice rich 
um, yellow uh, that comp is complemented by the, brain, the brown center. And it grows uh, to four feet, like it's, um, it's a sister plant, the, the purple coneflower. And um, it tolerates drought and poor dry soils. And um, it's, look, it's easy to grow. Wild sienna, um, it's uh, full sun. I guess we don't have this height um, in here, but um, it does like full sun. It's medium to moist uh, moisture, and it uh, likes the clay soil. It says right here, it's a bubble bee magnet. I'm not as familiar with this one, but um, I, like I said, I had uh, advisory from uh, Jane Giblin, uh, um, a wonderful gardener and master gardener who is uh, very knowledgeable. Wild, white, wild, when it went, uh, white, wild indigo, um, full sun. It grows up to five feet, so it's one of the taller plants that we are uh, presenting today, or I am presenting today. It uh, takes, uh, the moisture is moist to dry, so it's a little bit of flexibility there. The soil is moist to dry. Um, and they said here that the seed pods follow the flowers and will dry out and rattle in the wind, producing an auditory attraction in the landscape. And it's on the state special concern list, so if you can grow this, that would be great. Introduce this into your garden landscapes. The monarch butterfly on the rose or swamp milkweed. Um, this is the, um, it's a picture of actually my, my uh, rose milkweed. And I didn't know, I didn't know if any butterfly would show up, show up and they came um, and I live on a busy street and I only planted about six. And um, it was amazing. It was the best experience I've had. Um, uh, with gardening was having these monarch butterflies um, fly in and lay their eggs and um, see them um, feeding on the, 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 the rose or swamp milkweed. Full sun. It it's, uh, loves the full sun. It grew to, mind it grew to four feet. Um, moisture was medium, medium to wet. It uh, was well-drained soil. It was great on the sunny, um, on the sunny, in the sunny part of my front yard um, and it does have a very deep strong root and it is the larvae plant for the monarch butterfly it is the one or host plant it is the only plant that the caterpillar that the that the monarch uh, caterpillars can survive on also known like i said as a host plant and there's other butterflies um, with other uh, that um, have host plants as well but if you want to look that up, please do. Um, just Google host plants and uh, Michigan native butterflies, and you can um, uh, learn more. Uh, once you start learning about butterflies and, and insects and these host plants, it's fascinating. These are two, um, two of the milkweeds that I suggested or we suggested in the starter garden. Um, home garden or business garden landscape is the rose or swamp milkweed and the butterfly milkweed. They're, they're um, very pretty plants. Um, they're easy to control, meaning that they, um, you can, um, they won't, um, they, the roots, they don't um, grow, they don't propagate through the uh, sitting roots out. So meaning that you can contain them and they won't take over your yard. The common milkweed does have a tendency to do that. Um, they both love full sun. Um, the height is a shorter than the rose milkweed, and it does uh, like well-drained, uh, dry to medium soil. They're drought tolerant. They're, I, when you're out, uh, if you're out in the woods and along the trails, you can see this. Uh, this usually there's a lot of this orange uh, butterfly milkweed. It's a beautiful orange color. It's also the host for the host plant for the for the monarch butterfly. North Blazing Star. Um, the uh, monarch butterfly does like to eat more than the milkweed, the nectar of more than the milk, milkweed, and the North Blazing Star was another uh, plant that we had on our starter garden um, plan. And um, yeah, this is a uh, three, it, it does grow as tall as the rose milkweed, um, and, but it, uh, 
is intolerant of wet soils. So it, it doesn't want to be too wet. It prefers dry, sandy, and rocky soils, uh, poor soils. So um, as I said, our starter garden um, does uh, have plants in it that are tolerant of, of, of different soil types um, as well as, um, as moisture. And butterflies love them. So for the butterfly gardens uh, and the monarch butterfly, there's, you need to have more than the monarch plant and you need other types of plants that feed them um, once they become butterflies as well. Here's the bee balm. Um, this is, uh, uh, it has a sweet little smell. I um, really like it. It's uh, like full sun. It grows to three feet. It doesn't like uh, wet soils. It likes to be dry and it likes clay, dry and shallow rocky soil. And it does attract the hummingbirds, butterflies, and native bees. Um, and um, it's deer, deer resistant. And it uh, will grow around black walnut, which I learned, I just recently learned. Red bee balm is the, um, just the other uh, color of the uh, bee, of the um, uh, the original bee balm, which is, um, or this bee balm, which is a, a light pink purple type plant uh, color. And then the red bee balm is just a really nice dark uh, magenta. Same as the other, the previous bee balm. It uh, likes full sun, gets, it gets rather tall, and um, attracts butterflies and bees. And we have the cardinal flower. It's a beautiful, rich red. Um, it uh, loves the um, sun, but it will tolerate part shade. It uh, grows to three feet and likes um, moist soil. And it um, is deer and rabbit resistance, pollinated by hummingbirds. Uh, the great blue lobelia is um, is another um, full to part shade native plant. It uh, grows to three feet and likes moist soil. And then it also is deer resistant um, and uh, will tolerate heavy shade and wet soil. Here's another staple favorite. It grows easily. It's um, very bright and sunny and it uh, always makes you smile when you see those beautiful yellow um, uh, smiling uh, black-eyed Susans. I always see them as a, they're kind of happy and smiling. Um, they tolerate, they're easy to grow, they tolerate full or partial shade. They do grow to, to, to three feet. Um, they'll take dry to average moisture, sand, loam, and clay uh, soil, so they are very easy to grow. And, are, and they are in our um, starter garden plan as well. The evening primrose. Uh, it's full sun. It grows one to three feet. It uh, takes dry soil. You can see there's a little bee um, in this one. And um, he's um, eating his meal and he's pretty happy about it. And they will tolerate poor to dryish soils and they attract the pollinators and moths. The nodding wild onion, you may have seen these. Um, um, I have seen them. I didn't know what they were called for years, but I, uh, I like them. <laughs> um, they uh, like full to partial shade. They are not as tall as the, many of the other plants. They grow one to two feet high. Um, and uh, they too are drear and drought resistant. And also will grow around black walnut trees, which I know that some people, um, the, many plants don't. Here we go, the last season, late summer to late fall. Um, this one is one of my favorite goldenrod is Riddell's. It um, grows up to four feet tall. The bees and the native bees and butterflies just love them. Um, and uh, they are uh, deer and uh, uh, heavy shade, uh, they'll, they'll deer resistant, um, heavy shade and wet soil they'll tolerate. And um, you can divide them clumps and in uh, spring is needed. New England Aster. This is another one we suggested in our um, starter garden kit um, or starter garden um, plan. Uh, full sun, three to six feet tall. So you can see when you're 
planting your garden that you can think of these heights and you can might be you want to see that one maybe towards the center or the back of your garden it depends on if it's a uh, three-dimensional you can walk around it or is it um in you know against a wall and so it is also deer resistant and it's a host plant the turtle head is um uh thrives in full to part full sun to part shade so it really does um, like to be in some part shade um, and um, it grows to be five feet tall and it does tolerate several types of soil and um, it is irresistant the brown eyed susan um, it grows to be five feet tall it will tolerate uh, part shade um, loves full sun um, is deer resistant um, and blooms all the way through October. So as I mentioned before, Jane Giblin is a master gardener who uh, helped uh, helped me with the um, identifying the this, these plants um, and the uh, three seasons that you just saw. And I always, and I saw Jane's garden last year, and I thought of it as Jane uh, Giblin's magic garden. Um, here are some photos uh, that you can see that uh, some of the that, that what what a garden what your garden could look like, um, and um, it uh, is summer to fall at the Giblin Roadside. So this is right along the road. She lives in uh, Rochester Hills in a subdivision, and her garden is uh, when you're driving down the road, you you know when you've um, when you've come upon Jane Giblin's uh, magic garden. And this is her uh, switchgrass that's around her um, mailbox. And here is, um, let's see. This is her um, garden here. Um, it had, you can see the black eyed Susans. And um, I think there's some Joe Pye weed and um, some other some other perennials that if she were here she would tell you what they were uh, you can see that on the left there is some uh, black-eyed susans you can see on the right there is some uh, wild columbine the, the red the red uh, the red or the red plant and um this is her uh daughter or granddaughter and i just told she's 16 now <laughs> look like that she's enjoying the beautiful garden that her grandma grew here's a, some hibiscus and um here's a monarch butterfly enjoying the nectar So anyway, it's easy and uh, low maintenance. I think I might have gotten that point across. Um, there's a low cost to no additional point cost point of entry because we're not asking people to plant or add what they already are planting in their gardens. We were just saying to replace if you're going to buy annuals, the no cost part is this year buy perennials and then next year it won't cost you when they grow back. Um, it's, each, it's something each individual can do to make a difference in their own backyard. I'm not convincing people that they see less butterflies. They know they're seeing less butterflies. Everybody I've talked about to, they've said, yeah, that's right. I, I used to see so many more butterflies. I, um, they used to also, driving up north, the butterflies and insects would be on our windshield and lights, and they would just be covered in that, and now there are virtually none. So it's any, so the nice part about it, if you want to make a difference, you can, and it's something that anyone can get involved with at any level. Um, and um, our mission is to answer these two questions. Uh, when people ask them, what do I plant and where do I purchase them? What? you can do well plant a pollinator garden and encourage others to do that also you can like us the rochester pollinators on facebook um and um i think i repeated that twice <laughs> you can like us and then you can like us more on the rochester pollinators facebook page and you can come to our page and share uh, um 
and see what our, where our events are going to be. But now with COVID-19, we will have less events. Um, but we are going to be um, selling plants at the end of May. Um, and we will, uh, if you want to um, email pollinators at trentcreative.com or um, follow us on Facebook, we will uh, be letting people know um, when we're going to do that. Um, once you've planted a garden, you can send photos to us at that same email address or share, share it uh, with a hashtag, hashtag Rochester Pollinators. You can ask your local nursery to carry Michigan native plants, and um, you can also find loads more information of downloads at, the, at rochestermi.org slash pollinators. And like I said, the, the, we've got a garden packet uh, that combines uh, everything that we know and the knowledge that we have put together with the resources that we have had, um, you know, where to buy the seeds, how to germinate seeds, um, uh, and pollinator garden. Uh, plant plans and the plants. Um, like I said, we had mentioned some places that you could buy these earlier. Um, Plantology.com is one that you can uh, also go there and pre-order. Um, there's local plant sale events at the uh, downtown Rochester Farmers Market, Clinton River Watershed, uh, the Rochester Garden Club, and the Wild Ones. Um, I'm not sure if um, these events are going to be happening. So um, we put this together a month ago and I haven't seen any updates uh, to, um, to let us know for sure if these local plant events will, will happen. But many times local plant events are the ones that carry the real authentic Michigan native plants. You have to be careful. Um, there are big box stores that have um, plants and that have um, pesticide um, or herbicides in them that kill the insects. Um, um, it's called neonecticides, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is in the leaves, in the plants, believe it or not, that you will kill uh, the monarch butterfly and they put it on, they have it in the milkweed and uh, many other um, plants that will kill insects. So those are going coming through a lot of big box stores and others so you just have to be careful. Um, sometimes the plants will, will have that information on it and sometimes they won't. Uh, I think this is on hold. Um, okay, so for more information, I listed these earlier, um, prairienursery.com, MSU website, Michigan Audubon, Wild Ones, and the Wild, Associ Wild Flower Association of Michigan. So start growing native, download a starter garden brochure or the garden packet at um, rochestermi.org slash pollinators. You can learn more at Monarch Watch uh, or pollinators.org. You can help save the skipperling butterfly by going to nohlc.org. Um, there's also the Oakland Conservation District with their Backyard Habitat Certification Program. Um, and then Michigan State University is a plethora of information and you can become a pollinator champion um, at no charge and learn so much on their website. Remember, only plant Michigan native plants for the monarchs to lay their eggs, only plant Michigan native pollinator plants for the local pollinators to thrive and make sure you're getting the real, the real authentic ones. You don't wanna get, I mean, they have cultivars, but um, the, the uh, authentic Michigan native plants are the best. As you see in this photo, they are not weeds. They are very pretty flowers to enjoy every year, year after year. Um, we are going to, the pollinators will be offering pollinator uh, signs. If once you've planted your pollinator garden, um, we will be offering these um, for sale. Uh, you can um, visit uh, rochestermi.org slash pollinators to find out more information. Um, we're taking pre-orders at pollinators at trentcreative.com and uh, we can order the signs for you and uh, we're working on the price um, right now. So collectively, individual actions can make a difference and uh, we all depend on our natural world around us for survival. It's an ecologically solvable problem. It's easy, just plant Michigan native plants and butterflies and pollinators will come if you say, will come. If you save the monarch, you can save the rest of the pollinators. You can meet more people, you can make more pollinator friends and you can have more pollinator conversations. I have had an, the best pollinator conversations and met the nicest people 
and I've only been doing this a little over a year, and it has uh, been a wonderful experience, and I want to share it with everyone, and that's what I'm doing now. People are making a difference. More, there are more butterfly sightings throughout Michigan and Canada. Um, uh, there is the, you know, more needs to be done, and we all have to we have to continue to be vigilant. Um, and um, that's what uh, the Rochester pollinators and other um, we're not the only ones encouraging people to plant uh, Michigan or native plants uh, any all across America. Um, I would like to count, thank my committee, um, Jane Giblin, Anina Ignazic, Bailey Knudsen, Amber Queensberry, Stephanie Smith, Mary Tischler, and Rachel Williams. They have been a great help um, helping us uh, further our cause, spread the word, helping us at events. And um, good news, I'm, gonna, I'm going to say it here first, you'll be the first to know that um, the Rochester pollinators will be planting a demonstration starter garden uh, with many of these plants and more um, beyond the uh, few beyond the starter garden plan at the Rochester Hills Public Library on the west entrance. So stay tuned, and um, when you when you see it, take a picture of it and uh, post it on your Facebook page and uh, hashtag Rochester pollinators and hashtag Save the pollinators. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that this was uh, kind of long, and I hope it was helpful. <laughs> if you have any questions, like I said, pollinators at trentcreative.com um, or rochesterMI.org slash pollinators. And thank you so much. <laughs>